Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, traders and investors. Welcome to Wednesday's edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Benzinga Pro. I'm your co-host, Joel L. Conan, along with Dennis Dick, Chris Descarli, sitting in for Spencer Israel, who's on vacation. Uh, got a lot to talk to about today. If there was ever a need for a Santa Claus rally, it is today, starting today, and of course, uh, for part of next week. Uh, we're going to talk about Natty Gas, uh, giving back all those gains from... Uh, Last month, uh, we got a lot of green on the screen, so we'll, t we'll talk about what's up and if it's uh, moving as much as the spoos are and the spies. Gold is at a six-month high, and uh, Dennis keeps rebooting his computer because there's no stocks in his down filter. A couple good guests on the show today. We got Bill Studebaker. He's the CIO of the Robo Global ETF. He's going to come on and talk about that, the trading action, its big components. And then one of our, our favorite guests over the years, Tracy Reiniak, stock strategist at Zach's Investment Research. She gets away from the technicals, looks at the fundamentals, and that's, uh, of course, what we need to focus on. Triple D, it's a Wednesday. Did Santa Claus put a lot of good stuff in uh, in your, your stuffing and under the tree? Well, Santa Claus put a lot of stocks in my up filter here, <laughs> though, this morning. I'll tell you that. So <clears throat> call the beginning of Santa Claus, really. Call you what you want. And we're only up a buck on that spy. Seeing the, seeing the stocks a lot higher than that, and I don't know if they're going to play catch up. The stocks can give it back pretty quick. I mean, they're, it's not like there's tons of bids out here, but everything is bid up. So whether you've got nervous shorts or not, I mean, look at Amazon. Amazon trade up 20 points here this morning, up 24 points. So, you know, they did have some good data coming out there. But, I mean, I just look across the board and I see, yeah, we're up on the overall market, but the stocks are up way more. So either one of two things are going to happen before the open. The stocks are going to play uh, catch up, meaning they're going to start to sell off some of these stocks that are bid up in the pre-market, or the spy is going to start to catch up. And I think that's what's probably going to happen. I'm leaning more to, I think we're going to start to see the spy catch up more. But um, and, and regardless here, they're nervous this morning if you're short, because they are buying the hell out of every stock. And like I, I look at just across the board. <laughs> it seems like every stock is up more than 1%. Yet the SPY is only up 0.47%. I look at my down filter. The only thing offered flat in my down filter is a couple stocks. I mean, there's some ETFs. UNG is significantly getting hit here this morning, which is Natty Gas. USO also getting hit, but that was from after hours on Friday. But JCPenney is the only thing offered flat right now. Um, and I've got over like 700 stocks in there. So, you know, there's a few going to be a few other ones that are going to trade down. But holy cow, uh, they're pretty excited here this morning. Okay, and uh, let's just talk about uh, the close here for one second. Talk about the discrepancy uh, between the cash and the futures. The cash closed, of course, at 4 o'clock, 51.75. Then they hit the spoos. So, you know, talk about, you know, that trading action in the last 15 minutes. And then, you know, you gave a pretty good explanation. But you think the ARBs are just lost? I don't think there's a lot of Arabs going on here. There's some Arabs going on. It's hard in the pre-market. I mean, you're always, a lot of the programs aren't going to run at all. Because, you, you know, if you're trading S&P SPY versus the 500 stocks, there's going to be three or 400 that hardly have a market at all. So it's a little bit of a guessing game. That's sure. why the arbitrage is always a little bit interesting. But as, like we've said, you know, the when you get a look at the top 10, 20 components, it's a good chunk of the index. Yep. So. When you see a good chunk of the, you know, and, and let's just quickly do that. Like, let's look at the top 10. Let's look under the hood really quick. So grab them, Joel. What's top 10? Give them to uh, me. Microsoft up 1%. So that's a tad more than market. So yeah. So an S&P is up 0.5%. So that's helping. What else? Keep, we'll just uh, ring Apple 0.69. Yeah. So Apple's trading up more than the market. Continue. Amazon 1.71. Huge for the market. 1.7 <laughs> versus 0.49. Continue. Google 0.9. Hey, I, I'm having trouble finding stocks. I'm only up 0.5%. Keep going. Uh, you have J&J. &J. These are active markets. So yeah. these, these are fairly active. Okay. J&J is uh, up less than uh, 1%. Or no, okay, it's up J &J, 7%. But it's been a dog. It's right, been a leg. Right, so right. it's it's hurting a little bit. And it's uh, there's not much market there in J&J &J at all right now. So uh -huh. it could play catch up. We don't know yet. 
Uh, JP Morgan, 0.88%. Yeah, so there you go. JP Morgan trading up more than S&P's as well. Now, again, it's kind of a moving target because JP Morgan's kind of wide too, but same thing. I'm seeing a lot of stocks higher than the S&P's. Facebook, 1.32%. Huge for, and that's active. That's bit up there. So that's why I'm saying SPY seems to be trading a little bit too low to me right now. So, and you know, this is how I make my money is looking at little inefficiencies like this in the pre-market because these don't exist during the regular, a 935 is all correct. Because all the stocks are open, the HFT ARPs come in, and everything is in line. But at eight oh six in the morning, some of the inefficiencies do exist to a certain extent. But you got to play a little guessing game because they're ill liquid. It's not as easy to work it. So uh, just right now, if I was to look at this though, I would say Spy needs to play some catch up here. It's too low. Okay, I mean the the spoos are have caught. Are they're they're leading because they re oh no they did not even reopen at four fifteen, but they did reopen at six o'clock last night. Let's let me give real quick parameters and add our pre market low twenty three sixteen point seven five. We are almost 50 handles above that. That took us back uh, to some lows in uh, February. On the upside, I'll give you the pre-market high, 69 even. There's not much in there for resistance, folks. If you want to look for a target on the upside, uh, 70 handles is our average daily range. So that would take us uh, well, it, or it would take us into the 20. No, not quite. We'd be just shy of the 2,400 handle. Uh, Dennis, real quick, we don't talk commodities a lot, but you did have some stocks in your down filter. It was uh, Natty Gas Stocks. And what a rally we had in that in November. Yeah. Tried to rebound in December. Now you're right back from the point of origin from where this rally started. I guess we've had some more mild weather than expected, uh, but talk about one or two of the Natty Gas stocks. Well, I mean, UNG is getting rocked here. So let's just look at the ETF itself and break down the technicals. We're down 6% here. You're right. We've given back the entire rally that we got from November. It's very cold November. People were nervous, and it's been a very mild December. UNG definitely trades somewhat related to how you're feeling outside and how, what's the weather, you know, ask your neighbor, what do you think of the weather down there? You know, ask your neighbors, you know, when, or your friends who are not in your area. I mean, if you're trading this UNG, it's amazing, but it trades with the weather okay. and it's been a mild December. It's been not good for UNG. Again, everything got hit in December. So not surprising. I mean, oil has been absolutely destroyed. Not that USO and UNG have to trade together, but sometimes there's some relationship there. So I don't know, 27 and a half. Give us the technical. Is there support here somewhere, Joel? Uh, well, UNG, of course, files the futures. So I'm just going to do the Natty Gas Front Much futures because they trade at different hours. And uh, on that day that you had that gap up in November, and I'm just talking technically here because I don't know the fundamentals at all. And, you know, besides looking out the window and deciding. Well, that is the fundamentals looking yeah. out the window. <laughs> Uh, yeah, what did we do without the Weather Channel, Dennis? Did you ever know what to do without the Weather Channel? Did you ever know how to dress? I wonder if the Natty Gas traders, if they just keep the Weather Channel on 24 hours a day, like squawking the weather at them. <laughs> Any, <laughs> anyways, the anyways, to fi uh, fill that gap, 3.316. Uh, that was on the front, 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 future, front month futures in November. And uh, we've almost gotten there. We got to 3.252. So for another 10 cents, you'll have a gap fill, you know, maybe look for a rebound trade in that. Uh, Dennis, let's, before we go into some more things, just, uh, I know you've been nervous about your long-term portfolio uh -huh. and, and I know you're not chasing this rally today, but you're going to sit things out for the rest of the year. Santa Claus rally, January effect. Is there, is there anything I pretty much have sat tight through this and, uh, you know, I've taken my lumps, haven't redeployed any new cash yet, but uh, is that something you're going to wait for the first of the year to take a look at or maybe dip um, it underwater? I've got a lot of cash. Like I said, I raised some cash there. Not enough because my portfolio has been killed. I don't know. I, I mean, part of me wants to dive in and start buying stocks here because some stocks are just playing out flat out cheap. But we haven't had any signal that there's any type of a bottom for. I mean, there's a lot of people who are probably, you know, getting blown out in this. Anybody who's on margin is getting blown out. This is why I hate buying stocks on margin, especially if you're an investor. I just think it's a terrible thing to do. I mean, there's a lot of arguments, I guess, for it. You know, if you have stocks going up, it's great. But it's a double-edged sword when you get into leverage. And uh, in this case, people are getting killed. But, I mean, you look at a stock like FedEx. It goes from 230 down to 150 bucks. Trade, what, nine, ten times forward earnings here? It's dirt cheap. Uh, but the things keep getting cheaper. So have your shopping list. If you are if you got 100% cash right now, I would be nibbling. But I'm sitting with 40% cash, which is too much as well. 
but I'm still nervous. Um, so I think you could, I, I don't know where, nobody's going to be able to call the bottom. It's just, you know, and here's sure. the spy coming in and the stocks are trying to come in as well. I mean, it just shows to show you this market just cannot catch a bit. Even with all the S&P stocks getting bit up here this morning. They're going to sell spy off anyways, and it looks like it wants to go the other way. And I'm starting to see some stocks coming to my down filter. MO just popped in there. So there's a few stocks starting to come into my down filter there. But um, I, let's wait till we can get a ripper rally. Like I have 500 Dow point up to give me something, you know, because right now it's been just straight down. So if you're coming in here buying, you, you could have said this last week, it could be a thousand yeah. points underwater, a thousand Dow points underwater already. So let's wait till they stop going down before we really start jumping in, you know, with all of our money. All right. And uh, crew. I can't believe how much they're hitting last PY. I was just, you know, it's just down another 40 cents here just from when I was talking, but stocks are still bad. So I don't know. Uh, well, there's probably a lot of uh, spoo traders wake up this morning and say, you know, oh, getting killed on the long side. Well, the arms are waking up too and yeah. saying, I'll take this on. Yeah. So a little bit. They're hitting some stocks here too. So I am seeing stocks start to pop in my down filter. So. It's going to be an interesting trading day. I promise you volatility. It's the only thing I can promise you today. All right. Uh, crude. I will just talk about that real briefly. I know you have some energy stocks. I mean, just straight down on the, I don't think I've seen so many monthly candles uh, in the red and uh, crude, at least in a couple years here. Uh, trading up 28 cents this morning. You're 42 81. Uh, boy, maybe wait for a double bottom. You have a possibility of that now. On uh, on Monday, forty two thirty six was your low. Forty two fifty two is your current low. But uh, man, just traded only thirty cents off that. So uh, troubles in the oil patch as well. Uh, one other stock. Crude really got hit hard after hours on Friday. So it's basically opening where it was on Friday, or actually, I keep saying Friday, Monday. So Christmas Eve after the markets closed at one. USO just tanked. So a little bit of that. But oh, I, the, the down filter is getting let up here. So <laughs> I thought it might correct with Spy Might Catch Up. It's correct in the other way. Procter Gamble offered now. MO, Netflix just popped in the down filter. So we're starting to lose some stocks here. So amazingly, they've come in selling again. Netflix, when we started the show, was trading up near 235. It is now offered at 233.74 with a heavy offer. 22,000 shares. Somebody's selling Netflix. So there's not a lot of individual news here this morning, but there is some sellers coming in here in the last few minutes. Uh, did you know, I mean, any lack of liquidity on, I mean, Monday, I mean, they hit it pretty good. Did you notice any difference in your trading as far as, you know, the size or the, you know, I mean, I think they jammed up a lot of volume. In there was this, this light, light after hours, very light trading action. They hit her down. Like you said, they might have just jammed it down and there, it wasn't much to it. I mean, there wasn't a lot of liquidity there on anything. So it was a very quiet session, really. But they did hit the stocks. Okay. All right. Uh, S&Ps have tailed off. Still up 18 and a quarter. Uh, just uh, one other we'll talk. One other commodity here before we take a break. Uh, gold at a six-month high here. Uh, 12, 7, 12.80 right now. Trading up $8.20. So I guess the uh, flight to quality is looking a little bit here in the gold market. Maybe sneak into the 1300 handles soon. Uh, I know you have uh, haven't been a big fan of gold stocks. Has anything uh, changed during this recent sell-off in the markets still not a fan of gold stocks i actually sold i had one gold etf which i didn't even realize i had this is funny when you got that many stocks it was in a retirement account a smaller and i was like you know what it's had a nice rally i'm still not a long-term believer in gold so i think I, the only thing i have left i have a little bit of silver left but i have almost no gold exposure it'd be less than one percent of my overall portfolio and i've not been a gold fan for a while obviously i've been wrong because gold has had a nice rally. That's market related, though. I don't think it's because everybody all of a sudden, you know, likes gold again, just market related. So gold catches a bit when the market goes into the doldrums and it has. But I think there's better hedges out there. If, you, well, if you're nervous about the market, if you're that nervous and you want to have gold, you can short stocks. I mean, it's go down a lot faster and gold goes up. That's for sure. All right. But I think you're way late to that party now. I think if you're coming here and shorting stocks now, you're asking to get your face ripped off. I think we're late. I think we're going to have one of the, uh, I'll predict. Prediction this is a prediction here. I don't know when it's going to happen, but by the end of the year, so I'm going to say within the next, what do we have? Four trading days left this year? Three, uh, four? Wednesday, Thursday, How many left? Friday, Monday, four. Including four trading days. We're going to have like a thousand point Dow rally one of these days. So <laughs> it's going to be one of the biggest rallies ever. It's going to get major headlines. It's because we're just so oversold. 
So does that change anything? Does that make me you know, want to go and buy stocks right now? No, because I don't know like <laughs> how long it's even going to hold. I think there's be a lot of people. I'd be, probably be selling that rally. But I think we're going to have a major rip your face off rally coming here in the next few days. Because I, it's I, too easy for the shorts. I agree, I agree with you. All right, Dennis, we're going to let you I go. mean, you look at Square. Square is straight down $70 two weeks ago, 50 bucks. I mean, Amazon. Amazon was seventeen hundred dollars. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight trading sessions ago. It's thirteen hundred. I mean, everything is just so. We gotta oversold. go a triple D. We gotta go to a guest here. We got that. Okay. Bill, Bill Studebaker, CIO of Robo Global. Let's take a quick break while we uh while we dial up Bill here. Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's pre-market prep brought to you by Benzinga Pro. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconan, along with Dennis Dick, Chris Descarly, sitting in for Spencer Israel. We are joined on the line by Bill Studebaker, CIO of Robo Global and creator of the Robo ETF. Bill, happy holidays, and uh, did Santa bring you everything you wanted? Good morning, nice to be here. It was a uh... It was great uh, yeah, Christmas and uh, look forward to 2019. All right. And uh, when are your Badgers playing in a bowl game? They're playing on the 27th. So uh, coming up in, uh, I guess, uh, in a day. So look forward to that as well. All right. So uh, let's talk about the, the markets here. And uh, you are the CIO of Robo Global, the creator of the Robo ETF here. And, uh, so let's just talk about uh, the overall performance uh, for the ETF in 2018. Looks like we had uh, some highs earlier in the year and uh, maybe closing near the lows. Let's just talk about uh, the overall year performance in the ETF. Yeah, well, I think that uh, you know, from a performance standpoint, I guess it would be uh, remiss for me to say I'm not a little disappointed um in the actual performance but i think it's important of knowing you know where we've come from and where we're going when we launched our index five years ago we had belief and anticipation that robotics and ai were disruptive capabilities they were change the way we live and work um, these seem to be sort of niche technologies five years ago fast forward now five years later and we couldn't be more convicted in where the world is going these are capabilities that are going to change demonstrably every part of our life. And I think the key to long-term growth and alpha are disrupt is disruptive innovation. And this is the least efficiently priced you know, area in the market. And the market is not good at pricing exponential growth. This is what we're seeing in robotics and AI. And this is prosperity for all. 
and you know the acceleration information technology is at you know full form and you know the world's biggest problems are the biggest opportunities and as we look into 2019 um, investors have to be focused on this what kind of research did you conduct you know five six years ago to uh, you know draw these conclusions well, we just had the belief that that automation was beginning to happen everywhere. We, you know, I certainly understood, you know, very well what was happening on the industrial side. If you looked at auto, um, auto was principally well. Right now, it's about forty percent penetrated. Um, but if you look at, you know, every other vertical of the the market, every other industry, we were at our nascent beginning. And and um, you know, as we again look into two thousand nineteen, you know. We couldn't be more excited and convicted that our world is on the cusp of ubiquitous automation everywhere. You know, and that automation is being driven almost solely by robotics automation AI. Um, and, and AI technologies and applications are becoming central to every industry. And I think now is the time to focus on investing and and to stay invested in the future. I mean, everyone recognizes now what the internet did. You know, in hindsight, you know, 15 years later, the internet was amazing because it changed how we socialized, how we consume media, it brought about search, e-commerce, amazing. But that's it. Robotics and AI are going to change every single industry. And so as, as we look out the next three, five, 10 years, investors, I think are going to look back at this opportunity and go, why did I miss it? All right, let's look. Uh, let's look, dig in deeper here under the hood here in the robo ETF. And uh, so you don't you don't have any auto stocks in there, as I can see. And um, so just real quick, you know, before we drill down in individual components, I mean, let's talk about the car industry here for a moment. Uh, GM and Ford, Ford at an all time low. I don't know if they're uh, behind the ball in the automation. Uh, Tesla, I mean. Uh, is Tesla Tesla ever been considered for a uh, you know a holding in your fund? Um, well, Tesla's not. I mean, first of all, what we did. Let me just step back on our sure. index. Our index um, was the first attempt ever to create an index that captures the growth in robotics, automation, AI. Think about five years ago. If you want to invest, or how would you do it? We looked around, we recognized that there were no dedicated you know, mutual funds. There was no dedicated hedge funds doing this, very little in terms of private equity venture capital. Um, and so we recognized that there were some pure play um, robotics and AI companies, companies like Intuitive Surgical, mm-hmm. companies like Rockwell Automation, Siemens, and so forth, um, that had um, uh, businesses in robotics and AI. Uh, but if we were to pull up in a classic Wall Street gig system and pull up the word robotics, what would come down? You know, nothing. That was just an Elon Musk science fiction term. Same thing if we would have pulled up AI. So we actually decided to go out and create our own classification system to identify these companies. So we either identify a company as a technology or an application. The technology is what makes the time system work. That's the computing, the processing, sensing, the AI, the actuation. And then, the, then the, the applications are the use cases. So where is robotics being deployed? It's being deployed in the healthcare, in the ag, in the food, in the warehouse automation, industrial manufacturing, which was where you know, auto is, et cetera. And there's actually eight different verticals there, and that's going to grow as the market's going to grow. So that's how we decide to begin to capture this. And so we found in doing this that most of these technologies actually don't exist in the U.S., they actually exist in, you know, throughout all parts of the world. So if you want to capture this growth trend, you have to really have a vehicle, you know, that does that. Because I think it's a short lens if you think that you can pick um, what end market to invest in and certainly, you know, what geography. And I think that um, a, a prudent approach to it is spreading out your bets across the entire value chain. Um, as it relates to auto, auto is not a uh, quote unquote vertical within our industry. Um, it might be if we start to develop the business mobility as a service, um, then I think that we can begin to have a framework to um, capture um, and measure these companies. But as it is now, you know, auto is not a vertical okay. because these companies are not um, profiting from selling the technologies. Rather, they're just using these technologies to enable their business, if that makes sense. 
It does. It does. And uh, so let's start. Uh, the two top components are Japanese stocks, but uh, let's go take a look at the third one here. Zebra Technologies. And that stock has had a quite a haircut uh, coming back to that, not quite to the lows of the year. Uh, 1.93% rating. Uh, how long has that stock uh, been in there and what part of the company? You know, is it the overall company or do they have a sp specific technology uh, that you're focused on? Okay, so Zebra is an interesting company. I mean, Zebra was put in the index probably about three years ago. Um, when you um, look at Zebra, if you order anything from Amazon over the holidays, the chances are that Zebra Technologies was um, involved in your order. Um, they have technologies that enable um, automation with RFID um, um, devices, scanners, um, and, and different um, you know, sensing technology um, to help in automation. Um, they're very integral in warehouse logistics automation, trace track and control, but they're also being used now within um, healthcare for trace track and control technologies. Um, so really when you look at e-commerce, e-commerce is really exciting because look at the US, e-commerce is 10% of our sales, but it's growing 20% plus. Um, the the growth there is going to be way up in the right for years, if not decades to come. We're excited about warehouse automation here in e-commerce. But if you look at Asia, Asia, uh, the market is is um, you know growing 40, 50 percent. Why? Because of, of mobile payments transactions in China alone last year uh, had e-commerce transactions or mobile payments transactions of uh, $9 trillion. That compares to the U.S. in 2017 neighborhood of a little over $100 billion only. Um, so this is, is fueling the fire. And if you want to compete in e-commerce, there is no question you have to use these technologies to enable your business, not to mention if you're a bricks and mortar retailer, you have to find ways to use these technologies or associate technologies to become more efficient. So you know, this is a really exciting part of where warehouse and logistics automations are. And uh, we see massive growth in years ahead. All right, uh, here's another stock, an interesting one with a 1.22% rating. And uh, I don't know if you think of this in the automation or the global world, uh, Deer, D-E. Uh, talk about that stock being in the index and its uh, impact, potential impact on the future. Well, the interesting thing about Deer is if you look at autonomous vehicles, they're actually the largest um, autonomous vehicle, I guess you call it manufacturing the world, over 60% of their tractors have um, autonomous um, um, mobility capabilities. When you look at what's going on in, uh, um, in where, I'm sorry, in, in, uh, in agriculture, we couldn't be more excited where the world is going. We're adding a hundred million people uh, to the globe per year. So you think about the next 20 years, we're gonna have to feed another you know, 2 billion more people. The only way to do this is by improving productivity, uh, and generating more growth. I mean, we've been seeing this for the better part of the last couple hundred years um, in agriculture. Agriculture back in 1900s employed 60% of the workforce. You know, now it's 2%. We're producing more with less. And so when you look at, at this uh, end market, this is an area which is going to have huge growth for years to come, particularly as you use, you know, AI capabilities where we're now going to move into a world where we have precision agriculture. Well, we know through GPS technology where every seed is planted, we know through AI, um, it can, can track and measure the health of every individual plant level at, at, the, uh, at the micro level. So instead of in the past, we would spray fertilizer and water over the entire field very inefficiently. Now we're going to be doing more targeted um, agriculture and um, deer has a lot of capability um that will enable this to happen all right uh let's uh let's just cover one more stock in here of interest a stock that uh was a darling earlier in the year but it's fallen on some hard times a 1.16 component in your index nvidia corp maybe people got a little bit of ahead of themselves with the uh with the bitcoin mining and technology here uh how is this comfort integral to the performance of your etf 
Well, it's not overly in a row. We only have two position weights in our in our fund. We have okay. what's called a bellwether. Think of those as more of pure play companies. They have a two percent weighting. That's forty percent of our portfolio uh, where um, Nvidia sits. So we have um, non bellwethers or think of those as non pure plays that have a one percent weight. That's sixty percent of our portfolio. So our approach uh, versus others is very different because we're not concentrated. You know, having said that. Um, it is a pretty significant, you know, correction. You know, we built this ETF understanding, knowing, believing, recognizing that things don't go straight up and that, um, you know, it's important to um, have a measured approach. But NVIDIA, if you look at their growth prospects, you know, looking out the next multiple years, they're at the forefront of what's going on in robotics and AI. We recognize, you know, much sooner than the market over three years ago plus that they have capabilities that are enabling this AI revolution with machine learning and deep learning capabilities and their chips play an integral uh, part there. Um, There is a lot of competition. Others are trying to develop their own chips. The fact of the matter is, is that NVIDIA is light years ahead of the competition and um, they have the competing power um, to enable this revolution. So, you know, investors you know, love the stock at 250 bucks at uh, 40 times plus earnings and at, you know, close to, you know, 120 ish bucks, wherever it is right now, and a, a market valuation of, uh, you know, close to 20 times. You know, I think for those that have a reasonable time horizon are going to benefit by paying attention. All right, so we've talked about a lot of the stocks that are in uh, your ETF, but conspicuously absent are a couple of the big stocks that are supposed to be leading us into this AR and IR world. And uh, let's just talk about those two, Apple and Google. I mean, they're Apple, uh, obviously, with the iPhone slow down, looking to other technology and sort of stuff. But just make a couple comments on uh, on those two companies. Um, amazing companies. Um, they don't fit in our index um, for a oh, lot gosh. of different reasons. I mean, as we look at at uh, at Apple, Apple, um, you know, is enabling a lot of automation. However, if you look at you know what they do, you know, principally, you know, they sell electronic you know devices. Um, they have um, you know some AI as a service, really predicting more Google, and they have other services um, that one could begin to depict as being um, automated. Um, But the fact of the matter is they're really just using these technologies to enable their business, not profit from it. You know, Google 90% plus of their business is generated by search. You know, they're doing a lot in in healthcare and other segments um, of the market to generate um, AI um, revenues and capabilities. But if you look at their, their other revenues, they're de minimis and they're not growing um, at the rate that will become a bigger part of the mix. More importantly about these companies is that they're in everyone's index, everyone's fund. We don't think there's a lot of value in putting in in our fund unless we can um, really categorize um, you know, their revenue. I was on um, CNBC two months ago where You know, I made the statement, if you invest in the FANG stocks, I said, you are not early. In fact, I think you're late and you run the risk of being in one of the most over-owned trades in the world ever. And fast forward, you know, two months later and we can see what happens. Um, Great companies, they have great ecosystems around it, um, but they are heavily owned. And when you look at our index, Less than 3% of these companies are in traditional indices. So investors do not own this just as they didn't own the internet. They didn't own Amazon, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, I I think they're coming to the awareness of what's going on. All right. Bill Studebaker, CIO of Robo Global, joining us here on Benzinga's pre-market prep show. Our discussion is ETF, the components and the outlook. I will keep an eye eye on this one, Bill. We'll get you back on uh, early in 2019. Thank you very much. 
All right, uh, S P still up 16 handles at 2357.75. A little sell-off there, as uh, Dennis put in the chat. A lot of uh, selling balances here. So the ARBs are getting up, doing the work this morning, bringing this market into line. But uh, it is 835, and it's time for our second guest of the show. That's Tracy Reiniak, stock, stock strategist at Zach's Investment Research. We'll be right back with Tracy. Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Benzinga Pro. I'm your co-host, Joel Elkanen, along with Dennis Dick, and we are joined on the line by Tracy Raniak. She's a stock strategist at Zach's Investment Research. Uh, Tracy, are you in Atlanta for the Peach Bowl? I'm not, but I'm excited about this game because Michigan usually plays real well against Florida. They do. They're actually 4-0, and oh, and I'd really like to yeah. make it 5-0 and oh here. Um, and uh, have you been – I know you're in the Chicago area, right? Yep. Did you, uh, did you make it out to the Michigan-Northwestern basketball game a couple weeks ago? I did not. You did not. But the basketball team, you know, is looking real good, so <laughs> – I'm excited about where that's going to go once the football season is over. Yeah, we're, we're a basketball school. People don't seem to understand that, right? We're a basketball <laughs> school. But uh, let's just uh, wrap up the year here, you know, being a stock strategist at a you know, well-known firm like Zach's. Uh, man, it's a tough year here. The year's not over yet. We could, you know perhaps get a rally at the end of the year, but just, you know, overall, like, you know, doing your research, looking at the technicals, looking at the fundamentals, you know, what, what do you say to your clients here after a, a year of volatility like we have? Well, there's no doubt that the last couple of weeks in particular have been um, a little stressful for most investors, but this is also coming off of the 2017 year where it basically was perfect market conditions. Like we will likely never see those market conditions again in our lifetime. So that's what makes it feel even more extreme that we went from something that saw very little volatility and um, just, like I said, great market conditions to slightly more volatility and we're just not used to it. But this last month has been a change in the normal that we normally see happening in December. And I think that has thrown people for a little bit more of a loop. But as a value investor, I really like what I'm seeing now after uh, this correction has happened. Just value, you know, has been really trailing growth over the last, I would say, four years, four to five years now. And this could be a start to see a turning point possibly where value starts to come more into focus. I feel like many more investors are starting to pay attention to who is doing share buybacks, who is, has a dividend and maybe raising the dividend, um, those kind of shareholder friendly things. And then they are looking to see who is cheap. So that's something to keep in mind for 2019. I feel like there are a lot of stocks on sale right now. And that investors will start to make that turn, to, uh, maybe away from the growth and more towards the value. And so you're not, you're not, uh, you don't see a big bad recession coming down the pipeline, and the Fed doesn't know what they're doing by raising interest rates here. That uh, we're actually in a slowing economy, and the, you know the Fed's got it totally wrong. So you have a little bit of uh, different outlook, you know, after three percent GDP growth. Um, without a doubt, we're going to see a recession at some point. Right now, there are no real recession indicators <laughs> flashing. And one thing that I like to keep an eye on is the unemployment. It's a little bit of a, tra uh, a, 
a trailing indicator, but it will give you some clues once those weekly jobless claims start to spike higher. And they have to go much higher than the recent uh, slight increase we've seen. They have to go back up over 300,000 for uh, that to be signaling. And then you're going to start to see the um, unemployment rise again slightly and the monthly data start to look a little bit worse. But we haven't been seeing any of that. Not yet. Of course, that could change. A lot of the economists are looking for um, more of a real slowdown in the second half of the year. Uh, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. But right now, none of the things that I traditionally look at, like unemployment or even the ISM surveys, both manufacturing and service, uh, last month were trading near the 60 level, which is nowhere near what you'd see for a recession. So um, I feel like the recession worries are overblown, okay. but the market is forward looking. So it's it's thinking we might get one in the second half of the year, and it's already pricing that in. Surely is. So let's go to some of those value stocks here. Do you want to go? Do you want to go sectors, or do you want to go individual stocks? How would you like to attack it? Um, let's do let's do some individual stocks, but in some sectors that I know are really beaten down. Okay. <laughs> How about that? Um, Basically, the banks are dirt cheap. I know people aren't excited about them, and they haven't been for quite some time, but they've really sold off hard here. One of the big name banks people should be looking at is Citigroup. That's the ticker C. They're trading at just seven and a half times now, and they have nearly a 4% dividend yield. So I, I still really like the big banks. This is not 2008 where they have a lot of danger on their balance sheets. So people looking for value should be looking at all of the banks, but the big ones are especially cheap here. Then I also like the chemical sector. This is an area that most people are kind of ignoring because it's not real popular either. But uh, one of the names that's really dirt cheap in there is Huntsman. That's ticker H-U-N. They're trading at just five and a half times their forward earnings here. And they're almost paying a 4% dividend yield as well. It's 3.6 right now. So I really like chemicals and they're cheap. And um, I think people should should kind of search around in that area for some real good names with the dividends. And then on retail, retail's oh. kind of back in the doghouse here, ah. even with this great data. Like how could that be? But it is. And you start, I think you'll see a bounce today in some of the retailers because that data was so good. But Macy's is dirt cheap once again. That's ticker M. It's trading with just a PE of 6.7 right now. And you get that really juicy dividend yield. It's about 5.5% right now. And they did not cut it in 2017 when everybody said they were doomed and every, you know, retail was awful and Amazon would take over the world. But um, they, they did not cut then. And so I feel like that dividend, at least for right now, is somewhat safe. So I think people need to be looking in the beaten down sectors. And I won't even get into energy because basically all of energy is on sale. But yeah. that is a reflection of crude prices, obviously, and it's unclear when that's going to bottom. So still could see a little bit of downside on the energy stocks. That's uh, that you need a strong stomach to be buying the energy yeah, here. Yeah, you sure do. Um, and uh, any, you know, any sectors maybe that are individual stocks that you're, you're kind of avoiding here. I mean, you did, you know, talk about the rotation from, uh, you know, from, you know, high beta to, to value here. So yeah. are, you, are you still staying away from, I mean, Facebook's getting down there at an <laughs> awful low PE. I mean, Apple yeah. beat up. I mean, are these things, you know, they just, they had their glory day and it's over and uh, overhead supply is going to rule the world on them or, you know, is there any stocks, any of the, uh, you know, high beta stocks that are catching your interest? Um, I'm staying away from most of those right here because they still might have further downside, but I'm monitoring them because they could get real juicy here. <laughs> they, they are cheaper. And I noticed that Amazon is actually trading at what is, I believe it's lowest PE ever at just 68 times. 
but that's that's very cheap considering it was at I think 300 times just a couple months ago, and then it was over 100, you know, a little bit in between there, and now it's at 68. So um, yeah, I'm keeping my eyes on the fangs. I'm staying away from the semiconductors because I do think we're in the the downward side of that cycle. And yes, they look cheap, but they're they're basically value traps here, and that includes Nvidia. Um, that's not the cheapest among them, but Nvidia is now a lot cheaper than it used to be. But I'm on the sidelines with the semis until it becomes a little clearer how long this down cycle is going to be, because that's that's normal with the semiconductors, though, because they always do this. Uh, do you have do you have individual price targets on stocks, or is it just kind of you know how do you do? It? I know a lot of these analysts come out with like specifics ratings and specific targets. Is that something you do, or just trying? try and monitor the price action as it goes along. I, I do not have price targets. So I just monitor as it goes along and I go much more for just the valuation side instead of the chart, basically. So I'll buy when it's cheap on a valuation basis and um, not pay as much attention to what the target prices are. All right. And uh, I just want to you know, ask you about stock. What individual stock here, like, like Microsoft, I know it's, a, you know, it's definitely, you know, a lower P of some of these stocks, but you know, if you think about it and I try, try and look at it from two perspectives, uh, one is, man, this thing is still not that far from its all time high. Right. So if the market's going to continue lower, here's a stock that, you know, could pull back, you know, what, 75, 80 bucks. On the other hand, I put my market hat on and like, well, if it hasn't gone down in this market, if the, you know, if the market turns around or stay flats, this thing could rip and right you know, be right back at new all-time highs. Uh, any comments on Microsoft? Microsoft's been holding up far better than a lot of the other big tech names. I did own this in my own personal portfolio until last week, actually. Last week? <laughs> when I okay. sold it to um, make room to add to a few other positions. But I do believe I would be able to get in at a much lower level. We'll see if that actually turns out to be true. But I love Microsoft's business right here. And I think they're doing everything correct. So if I could get it um, a, you know, a decent amount cheaper, then I will. But you are right that it has not sold off as much as a lot of the other names. And um, so I may not be able to get it much cheaper, but we'll see. We'll now, see over you, the next couple of weeks. If, if you sold it over the last week or so, then uh, you did okay because it lost that hundred dollar level and just uh, it just kept on going lower, trading up a little bit in the pre market today, uh, up sixty seven yeah. cents at ninety four eighty. Well, any any other words of advice for uh, for investors? Just broad advice here. After you know, that's another thing that people don't put the markets in perspective. They look at oh, well, we hit the highs in two thousand eighteen. So actually, my portfolio is down sixteen percent or whatever. Uh, but they don't look at the you know where the market was two, three, five, ten years ago. Here, uh, just uh, you know, give us uh, words of wisdom for two thousand nineteen just for the overall market and overall investing? I think a lot of people can benefit from dollar cost averaging in these kinds of market conditions. And people forget about that, that if you put in um, you know, small amounts as it declines, it actually works in your favor because you are getting the stocks cheaper. So if you're starting to stress out about it, think about dollar cost averaging. It doesn't have to be big amounts necessarily but you are getting them on sale and definitely look at your favorite stocks because a lot of them are on sale right now. And remember what the underlying business is that you're buying. Cause as we just discussed with Microsoft, they have an excellent underlying business. So buy the business and not the trade necessarily. All right. We've been on the line with Tracy Reiniak. She's a stock strategist at Zach's Investment Research. Uh, has given us uh, some pretty good calls over the years, Tracy. So really appreciating you. Uh, help us uh, finish up 2018 and uh, look forward to having you on next year. Go blue. Go blue. All right. Uh, S&Ps are dancing around pretty good here. We're still up 20 handles at 2361.75. Uh, stocks are pretty resilient here. Uh, big selling balances. I uh, knocked us Not off. big. A Not lot big. of sell, though. So they weren't big selling balances. I just want to clarify that. There was just selling sure. balances across the board. I'd say average, like, it looked like 75% selling balances. So 
that put a little bit of pressure on the S&Ps right at 830. I don't know if we had any data come out uh, coinciding with that, but they really look at the imba- opening of balances nowadays because it's kind of the way the institutions show their hands. Uh, but I, what, what I will say, you know, if you just want to see a few of them here, like you know, Bank of America, 93,000 to sell. It came on, on, in a little bit on that. BABA, 56,000 to sell. Still trading up. A lot of them are still trading higher. But the market got a little bit nervous and jittery there. We were trading up around on the spy around 235.40. And we sold off quick five handles at 830. And I think it probably coincides with a lot of sound loan balances across the board. All right. Uh, you heard uh, just Tracy. She mentioned, uh, you know, the rotation from, uh, you know, to value here. And uh, she mentioned uh, chemicals. And we were, you mentioned one chemical stock when we were on the pre pre market show. I think that what was it Eastman Chemical, EMN, I think. Was that one of the stocks that you had? I thought you Well, Ronnie Moss uh, over oh, at Standpoint right. Research, who we are going to get on here uh, to talk about his note from this morning. There are a lot of analyst notes here this morning. This is typical for this time of year. You rarely see a lot of analysts, you know, chiming in here at um, you know, at this time of year because obviously there's a lot more going on, and you know, we it's been quiet for the analysts here for a while. But uh, Ronnie here this morning from Standpoint Research put out a uh, a note, and he's got a lot of buys on there. And you know, and I don't know if you have the list in front of you there, Joel. EMN was one of them. He also upgraded Oracle to buy, upgraded Target to buy. Uh, he started KHC to buy, started GIS to buy, started HPQ to buy. Um, I don't have the note in front of me. I'm just going from my memory here. So if you have the other ones, uh, IB he initiated with a buy, which is ABBV. He started Carnival CCL to accumulate. Um, I'm just trying to grab the other ones here. Any, there was a few other ones too. I don't have it in front of me. Any, so any of those ca- uh, any of those catching uh, your I attention? Mean, and Ronnie, we like we he's going to come on our show. We like okay. Ronnie a lot. Um, there's not not a lot uh, really to catch that much of, but a little bit. Citigroup, I think, was upgraded to a buy as well. Wow. They're a little bit stronger than you know maybe if they didn't have that research note out there. Uh, one stock that is strong, if we just want to talk analyst ratings here just for a quick second, is Roku. It's having a nice morning here. The reason is Needham uh, made their top pick for 2019. Whew. So you have, you know, a stock that has been absolutely murdered, and I don't think there's any other word for it. If you look at Roku, just over the course of the last, you know, just a, the last month and a half, in Roku October it was seventy-seven dollars. It's now twenty-seven dollars. Talking about a stock that has, you know, lost seventy percent of its value in two months. So now you have an analyst coming out defending it and saying it's their top pick. So it's not surprising you're going to see, you know, a nice bid in it this morning. It's trading up 6% here. Can that be the bottom for Roku? Maybe. It needed, you know, a vote of confidence, and there it is. So this is one I would actually look maybe now on a pullback. Valuation's never been attracted to me. Um, but Needham saying it's their top pick is going to give a vote of confidence to this. It's helping the stock a lot this morning. All right. We do uh, we do have some overhead supply here. We are trading up in the pre-market at $28.89. That's up uh, a buck seventy-two. I mean, like you said, on the way up here, you're probably going to find some sellers because people really got caught in this thing. Um, I don't know who we had on earlier to actually explain uh, the issue and what they did and how, you know, it fits into the whole TV system, you know, ecosystem. Uh, but, you know, here it is. It's on the rebound. A lot of red days, uh, pre-market high stands at 2890, some decent volume being thrown around. Let's look at the daily chart and uh, let's see. Uh, you're over, you're over Monday's high, which is 28 and a quarter. I'd make uh, my next target uh, 30.08. Uh, that was your high from last Friday. Uh, we got a few minutes left here, Dennis, and uh, we got some stocks that uh, just take a look at some of the charts and uh, see if uh, we have any comments on here. Uh, the first one uh, coming from the pre market chat was uh, YEXT, and uh, that is Yext Inc. I know absolutely nothing about it. Horrible looking chart here. What chart doesn't look horrible, though? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they all look the same. They're all straight down. <laughs> uh, I don't know what to tell you, but this one, uh, you had your low on uh, on Friday at 1290. So we did hold up fairly well uh, on a relative basis here. So swing trade, 1290. I mean, that was uh, your low on Friday. Uh, after that, your next support. I see a monthly low at 1220, Dennis. Uh, any comments on YEXT? No, no. no, go to the next one. Let's just pound out a few tickets. How about here. HES? I'm sure this chart is looking pretty ugly. That thing got killed, and I mean killed the last five days. It's unbelievable. Hess, this is just shows you how bad it's been for oil. $50 on December the 18th, one week ago. 
it got down to 36 bucks. It just lost 14 points. And I mean, oil got hit. Nothing got hit harder than Hess. That one just got really killed. It's bouncing here this morning. It's interesting. You're seeing a lot of oil stocks trade up despite the USO trading down. It's just a little bit of a relief rally. Like I said, a lot of that USO loss was from Friday afternoon. So you are seeing, you know, a bounce back here in some of the oil stocks. XLE is trading higher, which will give you a good indicator there on a lot of them. But, you know, surprisingly with oil trading down here, at least the USO, they've got the oil stocks trading higher and has this rallying here this morning as well. But, I mean, this got crazy. I mean, it, and, and maybe, you know, maybe there's something big here, but, you know, nothing has been hit harder than oil. And that's, you know, in my own individual portfolio, I had a couple oil ETFs and I couldn't believe how much they've been hit. And that's, you know, obviously just owning some oil stocks and, and some, most of them are down 40, 50% in the last couple of months. And this is no exception. Hess back in October, $73, now $36, it's been two for one stock split, in the, but you didn't get the extra stock in the last uh, two, two months. Unbelievable. And if you look at, yeah, you were just talking about, you know, the high of over $70, uh, 75, eighty one. Uh, that stock uh, reached in October of this year. Uh, Arconic, uh, people are asking about that one. I don't know if that was sold it out of my long term invest portfolio because I just wanted to, um, clean it up. Well, I know I wanted to not, not just lighten it up, but I had a loss in this and I've, I've had a pretty good year and I wanted to take some capital losses because I've taken some capital gains. Like I said, I was nervous. I booked some gains. I needed to start taking some losses too to offset it. Arconic is something was the old Alcoa. It's been in my portfolio a long time. It was a pretty big loser there. I actually sold this, believe it or not, about two weeks ago at 20 and a half. It's $16. So I guess I got out just in time. So, but anyways, it didn't matter. I was taking it just for the loss. So it was, you know, a smaller position because I'd come down so far. I mean, Alcoa, we know the legacy stock has not performed well. If you go back in the long-term chart, the stock has been an absolute dog. So, and AA is the same thing. I mean, so anyways, I don't know what to say. This was actually in play for a little bit. I had hopes that maybe it was going to get bought out because there was rumors it was going to get bought out. I don't know now. I mean, it's straight down here. Is there value here? Maybe. Um, you know, I just sold it, like I said, a week and a half ago, 20 bucks, 16. It's unbelievable to fall outside as well. All right. And uh, let's see here. Uh, someone actually asked about GE, too. And uh, Dennis, you were looking at that 666 low. Still leaning tone. on it. You're still leaning yeah. on it. Yeah, I think the 666 could hold. <laughs> so, I mean, 699. So you, now you can play it. You could play it from a swing trading perspective. I say you stop out at 665. So I'm going to keep saying, you know, we already played this once. A lot of people, you know, made some money because we talked about this. We ran it from the 715 up to, I sold a little bit early, but, um, you know, it did get up to the 795. I thought it could kiss eight. It didn't quite get there, but I was pretty damn close. Only a nickel off. It's come back in. So it's like round two of GE. So I'm, uh, I'm actually not in it right now, but I'm thinking about playing this from the swing trading perspective. Um, just uh, leaning on the 666. Yeah, line. I mean, you got an out here, the tax selling. Yeah, is certainly. That's one thing. And then we, that's one thing that might bring it down in the next couple of days down, you know, to retest the 666. But I think January could set up okay for GE. It's on the watch list, very close. If, you know, you're looking at, you know, stocks that are weak and stocks that are strong, I kind of like GE. I think it's one that's held up better um, relative strength wise here in the last couple of weeks. And I feel like. If we ever got in just a little bit, you know, neutral, I think the thing could have a rip your face off rally. So I don't mind GE down here. I'm not saying it's a long term play. I'm just saying I'm leaning on that 666 low because I have an out. And uh, I asked Mr. Inch to come on this week. He is visiting vacation, but I'm going to try and get him on uh, next week when I'm gone. So uh, next Friday, uh, John Inch from Gordon Haskett uh, could give you some comments on General Electric. Uh, Dennis, good question here. I'm going to let you go after this. Yeah. Everyone's talking about have we seen capitulation? You guys think we have seen a true washout or will the markets continue to ping pong? No, not, I don't think we've seen the capitulation this time around. Obviously, you know, last time around when we had, and, you know, I talked about this on the SPY, um, you know, on NVIDIA and stocks like that. I, on November the 20th, I felt like that was capitulation. We had a pretty good rally where we rallied almost, you know, 150 S&P points after that. Since the, since the whoosh, and, you know, obviously I, I got on the bear train when we had that one big red candle, the bad one, you know, two days later, it's been straight down. Have we seen capitulation? I don't think so. But I'll tell you, and we're going to say it again, 
we are due for a bounce because this has been too easy for the shorts. I said it two days ago, and you know what? We keep going down. So it's hard to play it. It's hard to just say this is going to be the bottom, but I would be very cautious about shorting now. And I think you're late to the party here. I think we're going to bounce eventually here. I already said earlier in the show, I think we're going to get some rip your face off rally here in the next two or three days. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I'd be very cautious shorting down here. So I think you're late to the party. I think the easy money has been made on the short side. All right. Uh, we will let you go well, here at 9 a.m. I'm, I'm looking looking for a bounce here eventually. <laughs> okay. All right, Dennis, uh, Triple D will let you go, and uh, we are going to take another quick break. And uh, an analyst made a bull call this morning. Uh, that's Ronnie Moss from Standpoint Research. We're going to bring him on for a few minutes and talk to a couple of, uh, of his picks. We'll be right back. Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga Supreme Market Prep. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconan, along with Dennis Dick. And we are joined by Ronnie Moss here of Standpoint Research. And uh, while a lot of analysts are uh, taking vacations here and uh, reflecting on the year, uh, Mr. Moss, uh, you've been uh, busy doing some homework. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. And uh, it's nice to... Um be back on your show. I think this is one of the longest relationship, one of the longest relationships I've had in the industry. It must be going on twelve years now, right? Yeah, that's, um, that's correct. And, uh, I'm glad you guys are still around, and it looks like you have <laughs> yeah. a nice following. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, back in October. You talked to uh, some of your subscribers, out to your subscribers, and. You were cautious on the market, and uh, we've trimmed uh, 5,000 points off the Dow since then. What were you looking at? What fundamentals or technicals were you looking in the mar uh, at in the market that made you nervous? Well, yeah, at the beginning of October, I warned my subscribers. I think we were at 26,500 at the time. And I basically said, I think we're going to see 20,000 before we see 30,000. And sure enough, we dropped 5,000 points uh, since that note went out. A little bit less than 5,000. I think I was off by a day and a few hundred points on picking the top. Basically, the market was being propped up by low interest rates, elimination of regulation by the current administration, lowering taxes, and just euphoria surrounding the fact that this billionaire businessman is going to change the world when in fact nothing could be further from the truth. We did not get to where we are as a society with trade wars. We got there with free trade. And if I was in China, I could actually make an argument that China gets the raw end of the deal in their relations with the United States. So um, those are the main factors. And then, you know, China starts to warn about, you know, some problems on their end. And when China, sneezes, the rest of the world will catch a cold. 
and then you have 40 people leaving the uh, Trump administration uh, in the last two years. How can I have confidence in an administration when there's no one left? <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, it's just been one thing after another, and it's been a Chinese water torture for the last 90 days. I think the market may be overreacting a little bit, especially on individual names. So I ran the S&P 500 names through my 155 variable computer model over the weekend and put out a dozen names to my subscribers last night for whoever wanted to do a day after Christmas a uh, shopping sale in the <laughs> stock market. All right. Uh, I just want to be sure here because I'm looking at your note here and we had the 5,000 point drop, you said you would not be surprised if we dropped another 5,000 points. But that being right. said, we're going to double to the next seven to 10 years. Uh, there are babies thrown out with the bathwater and, you know, you're seeing these opportunities here, but how excited can I get about the opportunities if there's another 5,000 point drop coming? Well, I'm not, I'm not forecasting a 5,000 point drop. I, I, it just wouldn't surprise me. You okay. know, I think the market is still expensive. You don't want to fight the Fed. There are more interest rates coming possibly. That being said, I've been very consistent the last couple of years. I'm looking out 10 years. Okay. I don't know where the market's going to be six months from now. 10 years from now, I'm willing to bet you that the Dow Jones will be at 40 or 50,000. Uh, 40 or 50,000. Okay. So you're looking at between 50 and 100% upside from where we are right now. And, that, and you have to keep your eyes on the prize. No one makes money selling during crashes. Ask the people who did that in 1929, 1987, and 2002, and 2008. You're supposed to be gradually buying when everyone else is panicking. The same way I told people to gradually sell on the way up. I dropped 50 names in the last 18 months Whew. with gains of between 20 and 100%. And now they're trading below where they were when I originally recommended them. So you have to go shopping on days like this. You're not supposed to panic and sell because no one's going to tell you when to get back in. And it's okay if you're a little bit early. It doesn't matter if the market goes to 18,000 or 20,000. You just have to remain focused on that 40,000, 50,000 target looking out 10, 15 years. Now, if you look at that list of names I, uh, I recommended today, a lot of those names are low beta. So this was not right. an aggressive call. If the market drops another 1,000 or 2,000 points, then you're going to see me get a little bit more aggressive and there will be higher beta names there. I so want to talk about you, a couple. mainly of, large cap names that I get. Yeah, Ronnie, I want to talk about a couple of these in here. And uh, one I'm getting tanned on uh, pretty good here, uh, Kraft Heinz. I mean, it's, are people not eating food anymore? I mean, Kraft Heinz, uh, this stock should have got out when it took out $60. That was monthly support here. But uh, Kraft Heinz here at $43. Um, you also have uh, General Mills on here. That stock is off its slow. Uh, just you know, talk about, you know, uh, just overall, you know, the food sector, Kraft Heinz, General Mills. Well, if you look at uh, Kraft Heinz, for example, that's a 6% dividend yield. It's trading at 12 times earnings, 50% off its 52-week high. The market valuation is now $50 billion. It was $100 billion. Now, this is a name that I closed out with a gain back in 2012 at $56. And today's at, today's at, it's at 61 so it jumped $5.00 in six years since I got out, seven years since I got out. Uh, but obviously it's underperformed the market significantly. So the exit was timely and it's due to outperform the market from where it is today. Now, when a stock is off by 50% off its high, and we're talking about it's 52 week high. Okay, it was, in, it was at its 52 week high, I think in January. If a name is, and this is really important for your listeners to understand, if a name is 50% off its high, I'm willing to wait five years to go back to its 52-week high. You know why? Because the upside isn't 50%. It's 100%. If a name comes down from 20 down to 10, and then it goes back to its $20 high, that's a 100% move. That's worth waiting five years for. If I'm a few days or a few weeks or a few months early picking the bottom on this, that's okay. And if it takes a little bit longer to get back to where it was in January, that's also okay because I'm getting paid 6% to wait. 
All right, that is what the dividend yield is right now. All right, let's let's look at the, the wreckage here in, in the uh, in the financial sector. I mean, these things uh, had a rally off interest rates going up, going up, going up, and uh, boy, a lot of them have fallen on some hard times here. Uh, one in particular that you're taking a look at from a hold to buy. Uh, Citigroup here can break this string here. Uh, just uh, give us the quick fundamentals on Citigroup. Well, the the issue with the stock market right now is it's very deceiving to look at what uh, the major indices have done. I mean, if you look at the, the Dow Jones, for example, it's down 15%, 20%, but those are mega cap, low beta names. Most of the mid and small cap names in the market have dropped by 40, 50, 60, 70% off their highs. So the damage here is a lot worse than what it looks like on the surface. As far as Citigroup goes, this is a name that I closed out with a 58% gain on January 10th, 2017. It was at $60 at the time. So basically, uh, uh, two weeks before Donald Trump took office, I sold into that rally that we had that we saw in November, December between election day and the time he was inaugurated. I was selling into that rally. Citigroup was one of the names that I dropped a couple of weeks before he took office. It was January 10th. I closed it out at $60. Today, it is at $50. So it's down 17% in a market that was up around 17% since I exited the position. So you're looking at a name that has underperformed the S&P 500 by 3,000 basis points in the last two years. The dividend is 3.7%. It's trading at eight times earnings. 40% off its 52-week high. If it goes back to its 52-week high, you're looking at 65% upside from where we are today. And that's worth waiting a few years for. And you get paid to wait because when a name loses half of its value, the dividend yield by default doubles. We've been on the line with Ronnie Moss from Standpoint Research, uh, looking for some uh, values here amidst the wreckage in the market. Ronnie, great. We will keep an eye on these calls, and uh, we'll get you back on in 2019 for uh, to see how they're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, s and is hanging up here. 19 handles at 23.60.75. Uh, need to take out that pre-market high of 69 even. Folks, not much up in uh, as far as resistance goes. Monday, Monday intraday high was at uh, 24.12.50. Another big number for me would be last Friday's close at 24.13.50. Coming back on the downside here, mid-range on the session. I don't know if we're going to get to see that, but that would certainly be an area I'd like to take a look at. Uh, Mid-range on the session comes in at 23.43. So that's it for today, folks. A little bit extended uh, session here. A couple great interviews. We'll be back with you tomorrow morning. Have a great day. Uh.